typically an envelope shape is just supposed to get us to a place where we can see the overall height, we can see the overall width. In this case, there's maybe a couple of overall widths that are quite interesting. Of course, we have a very tall cast to kind of deal with. So the widths in this like come in different scales at different places. You can see here and here the indications of the edges of the frontal bone, right? So we have essentially the right and left side of the forehead. Now, this is me basically trying to establish a kind of one, two, and three plane model to the upper section of the cast so that we start to get a little bit of a sense of the second plane here in the middle advancing, coming towards us, and these other planes receding. Uh, I've also chosen the break in plane at the zygomatic bone where it starts on the front of the face and turns to the sides of the face. Uh, that is essentially the widest point of the face. Not to be confused with the widest point of the skull, which would be the parietal eminences, which we would find back here on the back edge of the skull on the right and left side. You can see the holdovers here. We can still see those edges of the frontal bone. You can see actually that I have started to indicate the glabella breaking away from that brow ridge. You can actually see also with the nose that I've started to indicate that, that divergence in between the uh, height of the wing cartilage and the height of the septum where it's contacting the front plane of the face. And I've also started to indicate the, uh, the left and right extremities of that horizontal center line of the mouth. So all of these things are uh, perpetuating into a later stage, but let's talk about what else is happening, right? If you look at these eye sockets, you can see that already there starts to be an indication of the shape of shadow there is a diversity of expression happening inside this. And what I mean by that is that there are entirely abstract designs, right? There are passages where I'm looking really at the rhythm of the form rather than necessarily looking at any kind of visual landmark. The difference in between the two, of course, is subtle, but let's say that we have shadow and light. And then, of course, we have other indications which are a lot more form based. Let's take a look at this bottom section of the cast, right? If I look at the cast as it stands right now, what we see is a form or a crease in the form that runs through the center of this. In the cast drawing, that is the crease in the form that I'm following rather than the rather complex shadow and light information that is also present in the area, but I would find a little bit less helpful. Frankly, because all of this is so, in a way, complex and abstract that I need to do a lot to kind of grab a hold of it before I really feel like I can apply light and shadow to it. Remember this, when you understand the form in an area, the shadow and light becomes a little bit more implicit. It's easier to kind of grasp what the shadow and light situation is going to be. So the next stage is going to be about giving ourselves a little bit more information to hold on to uh, without hopefully coming to a place where we're making the cast a little bit too realistic. What did we add at this stage, right? Uh, I talked a little bit about the eye sockets. You're going to find that, that I uh, discovered here the kind of crease in between the upper eyelid and the brow ridge on each side. This is a great way to start to establish the structural symmetry of the face. Now I have a couple different distances I can kind of look at in terms of describing and defining these, uh, these eye sockets. Uh, in other areas, right, uh, like, uh, like this, uh, I've started to search for these overlaps, right? Now, these were probably apparent a little bit in earlier stages, uh, but the role of the overlap in this moment uh, cannot be understated. It's actually incredibly important, especially as we get down here. Anywhere that I can locate that, I'm trying to do it now. Otherwise, going all the way from the top to the bottom of this, we could have one unbroken line that is totally flat. And of course, then it's one of the hardest possible things that we can copy. So we have a few different kinds of line quality taking place here, right? If you take a look at the line here, in between the upper eyelid and the crease, basically, that forms at the bottom of the brow ridge, and then take a look also at the shadow edge that's above that, right? These are two distinctly different kinds of line quality. This one, inside the eye socket, I would refer to as a form ending line, which is to say lines like that when used in the drawing, let's take a look at an area like this one, are meant to indicate that essentially the form has stopped. Inside of that line, we have the plaster cast. Outside of that line, we no longer have plaster cast. Uh, this is the kind of form boundary. 
the stopping point. I also use that as a kind of a crease within the form. In a sense, you could say that the upper eyelid is one kind of form that is ending and the brow ridge is another kind of form that is emerging out from there. So this is the way in which I rhetorically justify those two lines being a lot more similar. Then we come to the line that is identifying the shadow edge, right? Essentially, at the moment, we still have an abstract drawing. This is a line drawing. There's not really value being represented here. The value that we do have is the value of the line. And that definitely can have a kind of impact. But like I said, essentially, still abstract, still a line drawing. And I want to introduce a third. So we have the first one, which is form ending. The second one we have is a, a kind of a shadow boundary. And then what is this? And what is this? And what is this? Uh, what are these like really kind of broad lines that are a little bit lighter than both of those? This is what I would call a notation. I know that essentially the edge of the frontal bone is here. And I know that it's starting to turn towards the side plane of the face. There is a half tone value there, but I'm not making half tone values yet. Remember, this is still kind of a line drawing. This is still in the abstract, but I want to mark this. I want to show that, that I understand where the edge of the frontal bone is. What can I do to indicate that? I call these kind of notational marks, right? They're notes that I'm taking to remind myself, this is what's here, this is what's there, this is what ends in this area. It doesn't have like a direct value-based correlation to the visual landmark that it's representing, but it is like spatially kind of relevant. If we look at this contour now, what started out having just a few overlaps now is something that is continuously overlapping over and over again at every level there is an overlap defining one form coming in front of another form. Now, what's really cool about that, what I find super fascinating about that, and I love about that, is that the contour then is trying to tell you something, <laughs> which sounds crazy. But let's look at a, an area like this one. What do we find in the shape of that contour? We find one, two, three major angle breaks, right? What's fascinating is this. Each one of those angle breaks is a totally different form. And each one of those moments where the kind of line segment is turning is where we go from seeing one form along the contour to seeing a totally different form along the contour. So another way that we could look at that is actually as three totally separate volumes, one that is kind of interior here, one that is above and exterior and another one that is emerging out from behind that, right? That one, two, three kind of angle break indicating three totally separate forms. When you see an angle break, you should start to ask yourselves, what is the contour trying to tell me? Is there depth here? Are there separate forms here? Is there an overlap? Is there something I can communicate? Something that I can tie in to what's happening inside the form? I have taken a two minute run through and just indicated the shadow inside of the shapes that I already described. And I want you to squint down and look at it. I want you to just flick your eyes back and forth in between the drawing of the cast and the cast itself. It's going back and forth back and forth. Look for the, the character, right, of the light shapes that we find inside this cast. And you can see them echoed. You can see the spirit of the essence of those light shapes being reflected in the drawing, which, though admittedly, is not full of the values that we find, but you find the baseline, right? You find the characteristic definition or designation, the dichotomy, the duality between light shape, shadow shape. That's what we're after right now. And this drawing now can become really quite realistic. The next thing that we're going to be doing really is just starting to key these down and start to make some decisions about what the lighting situation is going to be overall. But we're going to stay away, for the most part, from half tones. What I showed you just a moment ago was really the first lay in a value. And I want to flick back and forth really quick in between that first lay in a value and what the second phase of value development inside this early stage of the drawing will be. Is areas like the mouth areas like the nose and areas like the eyes. Just going to flick back and forth so we can kind of take a look at what happens when we start to add that ambient occlusion, right? So really, these are just gradients that are that are coming from underneath the edges of form. So we have the overhanging form of the nose, we have the overhanging form of the upper lip, we have the overhanging form of the brow ridge, and we have these forms that are turning under rather actually they are turning upward. And so they're not getting the uh, upward facing ambient light. So the same thing is happening here, same thing is happening here. Let's look at the nose. And let's look at the glabella. In both of the areas, where we would expect to have some fairly definitive and highly useful halftone value, both of those areas are absent of halftone value. And this is really just because the white chalk is coming. And I want to make the point to you that the white chalk in no way is going to define how much halftone we can actually use inside the light shape. 
if we take like a, a generic form, right, like this little kind of tile shaped half cylinder here. So I'm gonna indicate, you know, a really nice shadow edge. And now I'm gonna take some white chalk, some of this brilliant, great white chalk value. And I'm gonna start to add that to the light shape. And I'm gonna add that in a way that goes all the way up to the shadow edge. So now I've added a ton uh, of white chalk to this form and I've brought it all the way up to the shadow edge. And what happens is that I don't have any transition. Just like in a, a drawing on white paper, I want this edge in between light and shadow to be transitional. What I'm going to do, however, is I'm going to allow the value of the paper to represent a part of that transition. We're simply going to allow the paper to kind of manifest a portion of that transition before we come into a place which is strictly shadow.